Today we'll talk of the architecture of the princely states of India. These were a political formation that began in the 18th century with the downfall of the Mughal Empire. As the Mughal Empire fragmented, weakened and lost a number of its provinces, governors that the Mughals had appointed declared independence. In addition, a number of small independent states also became more assertive and started building grand buildings while feuding with each other. Through the 18th, 19th and even the early 20th century, the whole Indian subcontinent was a complete patchwork of territories held by these small princely states. Variously titled Rajas, Maharajas, Nawabs and Nizams, these princely states were eventually absorbed into a patchwork of territorial holdings that the British acquired. While the British had their precedencies in Bombay, Madras and Calcutta, all three of whom have changed names since, the rest of the country, almost a third of it, was under the control of these princely states. In an effort to outdo each other, initially they built in the style of the Mughals, building grand palaces using a Mughal architectural vocabulary. But once they signed treaties of subsidiary alliance with the British, their new masters were the British and in many ways they started absorbing British architecture and needless to say British architects. We will look at some of these palaces today and look at how their architecture changed through time. Many of these palaces were built in the 18th century but over the course of the next 150 to 200 years, there were additions, accretions and modifications. And thus what you have is a palimpsest in any one palace of at least 150 years. Let us look at the palace of the Maharaja of Patiala. Built in the beginning in the 1780s, it was added to by every successive king. The whole complex known as Kila Mubarak is in the middle of the bustling city. It has at least 10 courtyards which control the flow of traffic and people throughout. What you see is uh, an aerial shot of this palace displaying the complexity within. Because it is in the heart of the city today, one enters it through a maze of narrow streets it has all the usual trappings of a Mughal palace, a big gateway, Ivan, a gallery on top for musicians and guard chambers flanking the big entrance. The entrance is large because the king, if he ever moved in and out publicly, would do so on the back of an elephant. There are large parts of it which now front the commercial streets around and you can only get the pristine grandeur of this palace if you concentrate on the upper stories. The lower stories are all shops. Large parts of the palace betray English and European influences. Once you enter through the main gate, there is a massive courtyard which would be about the limit to which the public and that too only the privileged public would be allowed. Nobody else would be allowed further in. That was so because this was the big Maidan, the assembly point for the whole palace. In front of it is a building called Darbar Hall where the king would sit in audience. Look at the roof line of the palace which is borrowing forms completely from a Mughal idiom. You have the Bangla roofs and the Chhatris that punctuate the skyline completely. Darbar Hall is a curiously European structure which has ornament that is Indian but the whole scale, the proportions and even some of the details such as the gable roofs are completely European. But beyond this big public square, inside what is known as the Kila Andrun or the inner palace are rooms that surround a series of courtyards. These courtyards 
appear in a bewildering set of uh, scales and sizes. They are also laid out differently because they serve completely different purposes. This courtyard, for example, was very obviously a pleasure garden, again deriving its plan from the Mughal Char Bagh of a quadripartite garden with some kind of focus in the middle. Other courtyards might have solitary fountains, terraces all around. These, one can surmise, were used for residential quarters. Within the palace grounds, you also have buildings that have to be built in the 19th century and are incredibly European in style, not just because of the classical columns that they use, but also because in places you have Gothic arches, fluted columns with capitals, marble fireplaces and the likes. This building was built as a museum. The roof line, as we mentioned before, completely borrows on Mughal forms and for most people it is the skyline, it is the roof line that defines the building because that is all you could see at a distance. Now we look at another palace which is really used in the 19th century, built, being built in the late 18th. This is at a place called Chanwad, close to Nasik. This palace was built by the this palace was built by the Holkers when they controlled large parts of central India. Even the village itself, which has the palace, has an enormous gatehouse and portal. The actual palace, just like the palace at Patiala, is set in the middle of a congested semi-urban fabric. One enters through great stone walls, passing enormous doors that are clad with spikes to prevent elephants from charging. Once inside, similar to Patiala, you have a big courtyard and this would be the extent to which most of the public would be allowed. Beyond that, you see an imposing facade. Looking back, the gatehouse itself is very different from what you find in this period. If one looks at the gatehouse from the palace itself, one sees the picturesque landscape that this palace is set in. Before entering the palace proper, one must appreciate the woodwork and the stucco plaster work that ornament this palace in its entirety. The front facade of the palace would be the place where people would be stopped, screened and most likely only members of the royal household would be allowed to pass. A lot of the designs that you see in the wood are also replicated in the plaster on the wall behind. Inside one enters the large courtyard which is grand in scale but not really for the public. This would be the kind of semi-public courtyard where only people who had real business were allowed. The palace is three stories tall with enormous amounts of timber framing and decorative woodwork. The first courtyard is incredibly ornate and has fine examples of the kind of woodwork one would expect in a palace. The third story has undergone serious restoration and therefore doesn't have the same kind of style as the bottom two stories. The ornamental woodwork which you see in the first courtyard is not quite replicated in the second one. So as we leave the first courtyard and go through a set of rooms, we see that the rooms are actually painted. Large parts of it are in disrepair and the Maharashtra State Department of Archaeology and Museums is carrying out an extensive program for conserving this palace. The second courtyard is of a much more intimate scale and of a domestic nature. What has to be appreciated though is simple devices like railings and screens also create beautiful patterns. So not all ornament has to be seen on the walls. A lot of it also is the interplay of nature and built form. The rooms themselves are long galleries 
which might have housed staff, servants and soldiers. On the outside beyond the second courtyard is another courtyard within the enclosure which has an enormous well. But it is here that you can look back and appreciate the fancy brickwork. We shall now move back north to Rajasthan and take a quick look at the palace of Udaipur. Again, very typical of the Rajput palaces, emulating all models of Rajput Mughal architecture. The gateway to the palace itself, which is outside, through which one enters and sees the palace. You enter through a series of portals where visitors would have been controlled. They diminish in size. You have all kinds of ornamental, beautiful details. And from right on top, you have magnificent views of the city of Udaipur because this palace is built on the highest ground. Inside, again, courtyards do define all these palaces. This really is the essence of domestic Indian architecture. The courtyards are very often flanked by long galleries where people can sit and live out parts of their day. And again, the top has a Mughal architectural vocabulary. A number of these palaces in the 18th and particularly 19th century used to import large amounts of materials from Europe or other places in the world. So, for example, timber from Burma, tiles from Italy, glass from Belgium were the kind of stock tropes. In the palace at Udaipur, even the finials are made out of Belgian glass. Again, the palace was added to over time and there are all kinds of extensions that show different kinds of architectural changes. We'll quickly look at Lucknow, where not exactly a palace, but the Imam Badas get built by the Nawabs in the 1780s and a style that might be thought of as very late Mughal with European touches really gets invented here. A number of European buildings also exist in Lucknow, side by side with this late Mannerist Mughal architecture. Gates like the Rumi Gate, which really are one of a kind, are part of this new or very late post-Mughal expression. These have been celebrated in paintings and prints, as this one from the British Library, for a very long time. And of course, the big Imam Bada and mosque was meant ultimately as an exercise in social welfare because all the people employed on building this were employed to relieve them from the big drought that had struck Lucknow. Now, last, we will look at Hyderabad which has a number of palaces, but the one we look at is called the Chow Mehla Palace, which again, like all these palaces, was built over 200 years. And what you see is some of the last additions, a clock tower over a gatehouse. As you enter the palace, you see a number of chhatris and trees, and then big courtyards in which you have pools of water, with buildings on all four sides. Now, wonderfully restored. The Chaumahala Palace also has the Khilwath Hall, which is the Grand Darbar Hall. Again, if you look at the architecture of this, there are elements that are European, that are elements that are very Mughal, and there are elements that can only be described as Hyderabadi, a style that they invent for themselves. The point of showing all these palaces, and we cannot cover all of them because every princely state in India will build a palace. A trend that you see over time is that from a Mughal architectural vocabulary, they slowly start moving towards a European vocabulary. And in some cases, they will hire British architects to design for them buildings that are described as Indo-Saracenic, a style that we shall see under the British 
and under the colonial administration in a later session. Here you have on top left the palace at Chepok in Madras, now Chennai. On the top right you have the Mysore palace. On the bottom left you have the Lakshmi Vilas palace in Baroda and right here on the bottom right you have the Umed Bhavan palace in Jodhpur. All these palaces are built between the very late 19th or the early 20th century. Almost all designed by British architects. These designs try to fuse Victorian European planning with ornament and detail taken from all over India, imagining that this is the way the new Mughals will build so. Thus, to summarize the four important things we see in all palace buildings from the princely states are the use of courtyards, the profusion of Mughal ornament, details that are sometimes European, and an aspiration to emulate the highest rulers of the land, once the Mughals and later the British. Thus, we now see in the 18th century a very important transitional time when not only tastes change but the political formation of the country is changing rapidly. The Mughals are notionally and nominally the emperors of India but a number of small principalities have decided increasingly to assert their independence. One of the ways in which they achieve this is by creating for themselves a unique and identifiable architectural style. Yet, the contingencies of climate, labor, available material and historical baggage, which they all share, leads to certain common forms. As we mentioned, courtyards are unavoidable. So are certain cultural forms of projecting power like hosting a darbar. Eventually, the British will also have aspirations to do the same. They will invent an architectural style that they think is suitable for India. They think that to, in order to govern India, they have to do as the last emperors of India have done. They design for themselves darbars. They embrace courtyard planning. But they also bring with them elements of architecture from home but they learn to adapt these elements to suit the local climate. Princely states fragmenting and creating regional identities is a process that we've seen earlier when the Delhi Sultanate loses grip over most of the Indian subcontinent and you have the rise of various smaller sultanates and kingdoms all across India. That is when you have new ideas of what it means to be from a certain region and these sultanates will vary in their use of materials, ornament and even sometimes design. Similarly, the princely states will try and assert their independence architecturally but as soon as you have a strong political power in the British, all of them will emulate the British. The British will invent for them a style that they think is appropriate and all the princely states will build for themselves new palaces or sometimes add to existing ones in a style made for them. In that sense, the political value of architecture and who controls the discourse can clearly be seen in the case of the princely states. Again, in architecture, there are no victors or losers. It is, after all, just a movement of ideas. Just as the princely states follow the Mughals and then the British, let us not forget that the British also learn a lot architecturally in India, which they will take back home with them. Building garden follies and big palaces for their own king, the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, which we will see later. Thank you.